Okay. Some of you are visiting this morning, you go, what in the world did I get myself into this morning? I know y'all are thinking that. I'm thinking the same thing. I, yeah, 19 years ago. I'm still wondering what I do. God bless you for being here this morning. Yeah. Did everybody get a hug this morning? You know, we're really kind of a touchy church here. But we're real sensitive here, right? You know. God bless you for being here this morning. Hey, on Wednesday nights, we, we have a great study that we've been doing. And we're continuing that. Uh, I'm going to kind of launch into that a little bit this morning. But, but I encourage you to come at 6 o'clock. We feed you. And we feed you physically and spiritually. Got your Bibles? You need one. We're going to be really diving into something. I've never preached on this before. I've really learned a lot in this message. I'm kind of excited about this to, to teach in a way that I've never seen before. So how many of you all know you're never too old to stop learning, right? And so, so really I've learned a lot in, in this prep here. Genesis chapter 4, you need that? And then we're going to go back over to Hebrews chapter 11, what we've been doing here. So I think we've got that. Uh, we're talking about Abel. I know you know the story. And uh, we're going to be looking at uh, a dead hero speaks. And what does that mean? So you got your Bibles, Genesis chapter 4? All right. Let me just kind of read this to you if I can. Genesis chapter 4. I don't know what translation that is, but I kind of like that verse there. That's a good verse. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll just read from up there. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to who? Cain. Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother who? Abel. All right. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. Got to get that, okay? So, so we know right there, their vocation there. And so Abel took care of some sheep. And Cain worked the soil, all right? Fruits, vegetables, so forth, okay? In the course of time, Cain, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions of some of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked on favor on Abel and his offering. Hmm, let's go on. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look. God did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, rightfully so. Yeah, what's that about, God? And his face was downcast. You could see it in his face. He was upset. You, you may be sitting next to somebody who does that often, right? Who scowls sometimes when they're not happy, right? Like comments that were made to the pastor this morning. Anyway, <laughs> verse 7. If you do what is right, you will, not, will you not be accepted? This is God talking to who? Cain, because he's upset, and so he addresses his upsetness, his anger, and, and he says, God says this, if, if you do what's right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door, and he desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, how did that work out? Hey, let's go out into the field. Maybe they wanted to go look at some stock, maybe some of the fruits, maybe just go hunting, we don't know, but... There was premeditativeness in this action here. So let's go to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. And then the Lord said to Cain, where's your brother Abel? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, listen. Your brother's blood cries to me from the ground. How many of you have ever heard that story before? Yeah. Sometimes we dismiss that because we fully don't understand all the details there. I've read this probably two dozen times this past two weeks here, just trying to understand this verse because I think I've dismissed it many times and I don't understand why did God accept one and not the other. And so here's, here's my question to us this morning because it's an age-old question that started from the very beginning of time, this question, and it comes in a form like this. How can I, a sinner, be right before a holy God? The Bible says it this way. 
It is appointed unto time that a man will die. And, and that when that time comes, and that thing that we all have in common in this room is that we're, if the Lord tarries, we're all going to die. And then the rest of that verse says, and there will be a time of judgment. In other words, that we're going to stand before God. And so that question that was asked, how come one is accepted and one is not accepted? still is prevalent in our day to day. And you will stand before God, and that question must be asked today, because the Bible says today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow, but today is the day of salvation. Settle this question today in your heart. How can I, as a sinner, be right with the Holy God? Do you get that? We've got to answer that question. How can I stand before a Holy God knowing that it is appointed unto me to die, and after that death comes judgment, and that is an appointment that none of us can escape in this room. You will stand before a holy God, and the Bible says you'll be as if you were naked before Him. In other words, you're going to be totally exposed. You can't hide behind anything. You can't dismiss what you've done in your life. You'll be totally accountable for what you've done with your life. And so how can I, as a sinner, stand before a holy God and be accepted and approved like Abel? So that's the question. And that's the mandate that we must answer this morning and for eternity to settle it. And here's what's happened. Proverbs says it very well. There's a way that seems appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. You see, from the very beginning of time, we see this story, and what Cain thought was right and acceptable to God, in his own mind became a death sentence. Do you see that? And so we formulated this from the very beginning of time, and we do, I think I have that, throw that up there, that sentence here. Since the very earliest time, the way that seems right unto man is the way of self-righteousness and of good works. In other words, if I'm sincere enough, and if I try to do my best, God will overlook my fault and take into account my good words, and He will let me into heaven. He'll find favor with me if I do the very best I can. And that is the mindset of many, perhaps, in this room today. If I just really do my best, and I really give it my very best effort, the better sacrifice that I do according to my way, God surely will accept me and honor me. We looked at that on Wednesday night. We looked at religions that are based on the works of man versus God's righteousness through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And so we, as we stand before God, we see this very similar thing that most world religions today have embedded this very thought that self-righteousness and self-works is a way unto God's approval. And it's just not true. In fact, in Jude 11, it says that those who think that way are misconstrued and misled. And it is the way of Cain himself that leads into this ideal that somehow I can work my way to heaven. And if I'm just good enough, surely God is going to accept me and find favor and welcome me into his presence. And Jude 11 says, that's not the way. It's the way of Cain, but that's not the way of the righteous. In fact, the Bible is very clear. Throw those other scripture verses up there. The Bible is very clear. By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. And then we all know that Scripture verse Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You know what that says. Salvation by human goodness or works is totally impossible. It's for by grace, through faith, that we are saved. It's, it's a gift of God that God gives us this salvation. And it's not of works, at least any man should ever boast. So clearly salvation by human goodness or works is absolutely impossible. And yet we find that often. So in contrast to Cain, him offering this sacrifice that was not acceptable, we see his brother in that same setting, in that same scenario, in that same mindset, in that same teaching from his mother and his father, and they both come and offer a sacrifice, and yet we find that Abel's sacrifice is accepted, and we have to go and look at this, I think we have to go and look at this, is that why is his offering, his sacrifice, acceptable and Abel is not. There's got to be something there for us because one day we will stand before God and what will be acceptable or not. Are you all with me so far? 
Sure is quiet in here. Oh, I'm talking, okay. Let's look at our text. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. I hope you open your Bibles. We're going to go back and forth there. And most of this will be on the screen. Because we see this one verse in Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11. And that's where we've been through the summer. Let me read this to you. So we read the story. And that's kind of it for Abel. And then we find this guy, Abel, he's listed in the heroes of faith. One verse, but he makes it. <laughs> that's kind of cool, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. He gets his name in the Bible. That's pretty cool. In New Testament, you know, 4,000 years later. By faith, say by faith. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. And by faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offering. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he's dead. The title of the message is, Abel, a dead hero speaks. This summer, we have been looking at biblical heroes. We've looked at some pretty great biblical heroes that are found in Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, we talked about Abraham. Remember Abraham? What a, what a great challenge that was to sacrifice his son that God told him to. And he goes up to Mar uh, Mount Moriah, and he's about to, to, to sacrifice his son in obedience. What a, what a great statement of faith that we looked at Gideon. 300 men versus 120,000. What a great story that is about a hero that his faith won this battle and, and, and even the odds were against him. He, he led out in that. We, we looked at Gideon and then we also uh, looked at Noah building the ark and how, how that, that, that whole scenario that he was mocked and ridiculed and that he followed through. And so we've been looking at this and now we come to Abel. I mean, Abel? I mean, I mean, the guy just made a sacrifice and he dies, and then he's listed as a hero? What is heroic about that? He didn't win any victories here. He didn't fight any big challenges. He didn't have to sacrifice his own son to, to make it into the Hall of Fame of Heroes of Faith, and yet he's in there? That's, that's kind of interesting, wouldn't you think? <laughs> okay, four of you think it's interesting. The rest of you just kind of going to endure this. I mean, what's so... What's so heroic about what he does here? He just makes a sacrifice and then he's killed and, and he makes it into the hall of fame of faith. There's got to be something more here, right? You think so? This means yes. Okay. Yeah, there's got to be something more here. And, and here's my question that I began to ask. Why did the author of Hebrews begin his list of heroes of faith with Abel, he starts with this guy. No, chronologically, we kind of get that. But he starts with this guy. I would have gone maybe to Moses or, or definitely Abraham. I mean, there are some big heroes of faith. But Abel just made a sacrifice and gets murdered, and he's a man of faith that makes it here? Absolutely. Oftentimes, I tell you, how do we interpret Scripture? Context, context, context. So we've, we've got to understand there, there's a purpose in why he's, he's number one in here. You've got to understand the scenario of what's going on with the Hebrew church and the Hebrew Christians. There was a lot of persecution during those days. A lot of persecution. And, 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 and so this, the whole gist of this when it comes to chapter 11 <clears throat> that the author is really st st stressing this aspect about, about you've got to stay in there. So for 10 chapters, here's what the book of Hebrews, kind of some information here. So for 10 chapters, the author of Hebrews has been arguing the case of Jesus being the completion of God's work of salvation, the fulfillment of all law. And so throughout the 10 chapters here, it says faith alone in him, that Christ's sacrifice was once and for all, that the redemption of mankind is found in Jesus' blood sacrifice. And so then in chapter 10, in verse 35, it says, do not uh, throw away your confidence in him. And, and then verse 36, it talks about the endurance of, of not ever quitting, of staying faithful to God, don't give up. And then finally in verse 38, it says that the righteous live by faith. 
And then if you have your Bibles, you'll look at uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39, and we see kind of the context that we're going to see in the Hebrews. And here's what he's saying. This, this author is saying to the Hebrew Christians in its midst of persecution and, and possible death sentence, here's what he says, but do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and are saved. Here's what he's saying. He says, don't give up. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be uh, opposition against you because you are called a man of faith. You are called a woman of righteousness. And so there's going to be opposition. There's going to be death threats. There's going to be this great battle. So here's what you must do. You must have an active, obedient, alive faith. And in that will bring some persecution and opposition. Do you all hear that? I've I got to set this up for us. So we fully understand this. So we've got to read the context here. So he leads into this to this Hebrew Christian. It's going to be hard. But I want you to look at some men that lived out their life. Even though they didn't see the end result of the fullness that, of the promises of God, they were faithful to God, and this is how we're to live out. Do you all hear that that's a message for us today? Yes. Our world. I, I pulled up uh, just in Texas about murders and, and, and just in that. Do you know that we have doubled over the last three years the percentage based on per capita of 100,000 people? We've, we've almost quite doubled our percentage of murders in the state of Texas alone. Do you understand that? Just recently, the church that, uh, Sutherland Church, what was the church? Yeah, Sutherland Church, that the guy walks in and 25 people are murdered. Do y'all see what's happening here? Do y'all think that's just a one-time incident? Do you understand that this is the direction that our world is going? And so what, what the Hebrew author is setting up, he says, listen, a lot of you are going to die in your face, so stay the course. It's going to get hard. It's going to be tough. And that's what I would say to each of us in this room today. You came to Jesus Christ, not in reserved army. You're a part of the army of God. And in the army of God, there's a lot of battles that are going on there. And what I read in this, this verse is, is that there's some lessons we can learn from Abel because that scripture verse that we read, his voice still cries out to us today. So what is Abel saying to us today? I want to share three lessons Wow, I'm not even going to get to that. I'm going to share one lesson maybe today, because this first one is, is, a, is a changer. Lessons of faith, acceptance, God's favor from a dead person who still speaks today. Are you with me so far? Yes. Y'all with me? Yes. All right. All right. Number one. Faith is always, say always. Always. An obedient response to God's revelation. You got to hang on to this because I want to teach y'all why why I made this comment, and and there's some some indicators that we can really gain from this because when we read this story in Genesis, we don't see everything here, but we really got to dig our heels deep into this to really see what this really fully means so that we can apply that to our lives. That faith is always an obedient response to God's. Revelation. Let me show you Hebrews. This is our text, Hebrews chapter eleven. We're going to go back to Genesis, but we're going to we're going to la our launching pad into this faith and hero faith is found in Hebrews chapter eleven, verse four. By faith, three times it says this notation about Abel. By faith, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable or better. Some of your translations have better uh, sacrifice than Cain. Now, I read a lot of books on this, and some scholars indicate, well, what's that word, more acceptable or better sacrifice? Some said, well, it was a, it was a, a more expensive gift, a sheep versus some fruit. Some people said, well, uh, it was living rather than lifeless, a living lamb and just, you know, fruit that's, that does not have any uh, core of uh, blood in them. Or maybe it was because it was a blood sacrifice and the other was not. But you've got to understand the setting here. Both of them have come with the same mindset of giving a sacrifice to God. Do you understand that? Do you all understand that? Okay, how many of y'all want to get out before 12? 
Okay, the more you talk to me, the faster I preach, all right? Are you with me? Do y'all understand that? Yes. Oh, now we got it. Now we're going to get out at uh, 1230. Okay. Yeah, I heard that. All right. So, so you've got to understand, both, of, both the brothers come and give an offering to God. Both of them. And both of them have given offering of their hands. Abel is a shepherd. He gives a sheep. Cain is a gardener. He gives his fruit. Most of the time we look at that and I said, that's a good thing, right? Right? It's the first fruits. And you can read Leviticus and God talks a lot about bringing the first fruits. So that, that seems to be all in order. But there's something that we're missing here. Why did God accept one and not the other? In Genesis chapter 4, verses 4 through 5. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain his offering, he did not look with what? Wow. So, so both are standing there. And they give this offering. Get the picture here. Both brothers are standing there. It's come time to make an offering unto God. And both are standing there. And we have one that brings, uh, you know, a bloody lamb. And the other one brings this delightful bowl of fruit and vegetables, perhaps. And so we don't really know what happened there, but, but they both understand that God accepts one and rejects the other. They both understand that God has favor with Abel, but he does not favor Cain. They both understand this process. We don't know what happened there. Maybe God often did this, a fire would come from heaven and would consume the altar. Maybe that happened. We don't know that, but make no mistake, they both knew what happened at that very moment. Y'all got that? We're going to build from this because he gets upset. So he's got to know what's going on here. So both are standing there. They both give an offering, and one is accepted, and one is not. So here's my question, my question. Why is Abel's sacrifice better than Cain's sacrifice? Both had good intentions. Let's break this down. Word better. When we think of the word better, we think bigger, right? We think more expensive, right? We think it a personal maybe sacrifice there. Don't we think that, right? We think, well, a better thing to give to God is a, a bigger gift to God, a more expensive, something that really costs me. That's a better gift, right? We think that way. And yet the Bible is very clear to say, first of all, God owns everything anyway, right? Right? He owns it all. And so, so this better idea that we have, my, my own thoughts, my own ways, is not acceptable to God because He owns it all. He, it's not the, the more expensive or the more costly. Remember what Jesus said? Remember the, the, His disciples and back in the temple area, when you gave an offering, there was a big metal container there. And the rich folks would come by with all their big chains and they'd throw it in there. And it would go, <laughs> make all this noise. And everybody go, look who's given all this money. Way to go. Recognition. A lot of money was given. And then you remember the widow lady? She gives two pennies, two cents. And Jesus says, check her out. Not much clanging, not much noise in her giving, but what she's given is quality. So the word better here, it's not quantity, because God owns it anyway, but it's quality. So better. So, so that can't be it. So, so Abel didn't give the better gift because it was more expensive, it cost him more. That's not the reason. So then... We see better translated as that. Maybe, maybe it's this. Maybe Abel was a better guy than Cain, right? I mean, there's something wrong with that guy. He killed his own brother. I know some of us have thought we wanted to kill our own sibling sometimes, right? I'm just kidding. Good grief. <laughs> I mean, surely that's the answer. He was really, he had a better heart about him, right? He was a better guy, and because he was a better guy, God says, you know, I like, I've always liked you better anyway, right? Maybe that was it. That's how we think sometimes. If I become better and better and better, God will like me more and more and more. Eh, not true. Let me tell you why I know that's not true. 
because the offering that was given by Abel, he understood the sacrifice of blood for the remission of sin. He understood that. I'll tell you why in a minute. Got you interested yet? Okay. And so, so he understood this. So here's what Abel is really saying. I am a sinner. It is only through a sacrifice of blood that I will be forgiven. So Abel himself realizes he's not the better guy in the picture. He realizes he's a sinner. So, so this idea that if I become a better person, God will accept me more and love me more and be approved of me and I, and I will be a favor him and I'll stand before him one day and say, hey, I was a good guy. That's enough. And God will say, no. No. So it wasn't that he was a better guy here. Just the opposite. So I've got to come back. Why is Abel's sacrifice accepted and not Cain? We've got to understand who's saying this, right? Because it's not our way that's acceptable, but it's whose way? There it is. So who says that Abel's sacrifice is accepted and Cain's is not accepted? Who says that? What? You're right. So God says it. So we get a hint here of what's going on here. And you got to dig on this. But let me show you in Hebrews, um, Hebrews, Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. Now watch this. So something happened here. We don't know all the story, but they both understand that Abel's sacrifice is accepted, and Cain's over here, and he's still holding the basket. <laughs> he goes, what? And then he gets mad. And God sees his anger. Do y'all understand that? See, he wasn't getting away with it. He wasn't hiding behind the fruit basket thing anymore. And he's upset. He's mad. Mad at God. I'm glad it's him, not us, right? We never get mad at God. So he's mad at God. And here's what God says to him. Watch this. This is, real. This is the gospel right here. If you do well, will not... Will you not be accepted? Is God saying, come on, buddy, you can do better than that. Come on. He's not saying that. If you, if you, would, if you would do something different than what you're doing, what, what is he really saying here? If you do well, if you do well, will you not be accepted? We've got to understand that do well thing. What a, go ahead, Joe, pull that up. What's this? Here's, here's what I think it says. Do well means bring the right, the kind of sacrifice that you know that I've commanded you to bring to me. So the well is not more or better, but the well is you know the kind of sacrifice that I've commanded you to give, and that's what you must do. Are you with me? Yes. We've got... To remove this idea that the harder I work, the more that God will accept me. The better that I am, God will accept me more. That, that if I do the right thing, I will find God's favor. It, it goes way beyond that. That's the surface stuff. But if we want to go deeper, we've got to understand when, when he does this, he comes to a man that was rejected, one that did not find favor with God, and God speaks to him. He says, if you do well, will not... You be accepted. Cain ignored God's revealed requirement. He brought an offering of his own advisor. He said, he says, isn't my way good enough, God? I worked hard. I, I really worked hard in growing this, these vegetables, these fruits, or whatever offering that was. It says fruit, but it could be the fruit of, of vegetables. But he said, I worked hard doing that. Isn't that good enough? Can I just do what I want to do here? Can I give you? I mean, it's an offering I'm giving you. I didn't have to, did I? Besides that, he probably thought, hey, my way's better. I mean, look at him. There's a bloody mess over there. That lamb's got blood all over it. Blood is nasty. Look how nice and neat my bouquet of offering to you is. Doesn't it look better? Do y'all see that? So God sees his anger and addresses it in reality. And he says, no, 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 no. What have I commanded you to give to me? You did not do that. Listen to this. Cain, li li listen to this. Cain is the father 
of all false religions. Cain is the father of all false religions. You know what he's saying here? He's saying, my way is good enough. If I just do what's good, surely God will accept me. What I think my way is, it's a bouquet of fruit. Of fruit. And, and, and despise what God may say, it's my way. It's the very best I can do. And so, God, you've got to take because it it's the best i got, right? And that's what false religion is based on. It's based on self-righteousness and self-work. You look at the two major religions in the world today, and you'll find that to be true. We're talking about that on Wednesday night. If you want to hear a little bit more, we're, we're continuing that. So that was a plug there. That was free advertisement right there. And so he ignores God's word in every way. He knows, he knows, he knows what God has commanded him to do. And God reminds him that again, to do well, you do what I, I've asked you to do. And he rejects the ideal without the shedding of blood that he can even have forgiveness. He believes that his forgiveness will be that God is a God of love and God is going to love everybody, forgive everybody, and everybody gets to heaven because God is love. He actually forgives eventually everyone, so everybody gets into heaven. So I can do whatever I want to do. And it's just not true, church. That is the religion that is preached in churches today over, over, and over. It's called universalism, unity, saying that eventually everybody gets to heaven, so... Jesus isn't the only way his shed blood wasn't necessary for me to get to heaven by me just being good, myself righteous. First Corinthians, uh, oh man, first Corinthians chapter 1, 18, something like that there. Give me some grace here. But it says those, those who are out of God look to the cross as foolishness. As foolishness. The largest church in America today is preached by a woman that says the death of Jesus Christ was not necessary to get to heaven. Oprah Winfrey. Yeah. She preaches all the time that. Listen. Or don't listen. <laughs> Jesus' death is irrelevant to my acceptance and approval of God is absolutely a lie that is being taught in churches and in the community of so-called Christians over and over again. And Jesus is demeaned of saying he may be one way to heaven, but he's not the only way. And that is contrary to the word of God. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah. It's contrary to the word of God. That's not in there. Watch this. God says to Cain, you know the kind of sacrifice I've commanded. You know. I, I, I don't think I'm reading into this, okay? Surely, what's it? Surely his parents, Adam and Eve, surely his parents taught him about this. I mean, think about it. They are sacrificing. They're making a sacrifice. Who taught them to do that? I think his mom and dad taught, taught them to come and make the sacrifice. So it's not of their own. So there's got to be some teaching that's going on there. And how did they teach that to them? It says, you know, I, I think we've got to understand this, that God clearly told Adam and Eve that the proper way of forgiveness is through, watch this, watch this, a blood sacrifice. Let me, let me tell you why I think that. You remember the fall? Adam and Eve, they fall. And what happens to them? Shame comes, right? And so they're, they've been walking around naked, you know? I don't know if it's butt naked or buck naked, but they were naked, right? <laughs> y'all know that? I, I, butt, butt naked or buck? Oh, y'all are wrong. Anyway, you know, um, if, you're, if you're from West Texas, we say butt, B-U-T-T, -T, naked. <laughs> I don't know why I said. Can we edit that? <laughs> so here's what. What's this now? This is really good. How did they know that? God has established that with the parents. And so here they are. They're, they're, they go, "You're naked." Well, you're naked, and they're shameful because of the fall. And so what do they do? 
Come on, what do they do? Yeah, they covered themselves, right? They said, man, that, that's ugly, so we're going to cover ourselves here. And, and they, they covered themselves with what? Fruits? Fruits, leaves, they covered themselves, right? What's this? You, you're tying it together, aren't you? Some of y'all's lights are going on. Finally, Jesus, thank you, Lord, that their lights are going on. And so they cover themselves, and they hide from God. And God shows up. Said, uh, what are y'all doing? Well, we heard somebody walking around. We were afraid. They had no fear. So, so you know, we're hiding. And he said, what are y'all wearing? <laughs> what is that? You know, and who told you you were naked? Hey, what is this about? What's this? See, God, God did not ordain their own handiwork in covering themselves. He said, oh, no, 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 no. And what does God do? Here comes the first blood sacrifice. He kills an animal and covers them because of their sin. Cain knew that the only way of approval and favor and acceptance of God was through a blood sacrifice. God demonstrated that to them. And it's still true today. Still true today. God didn't accept the fig leaves that they covered them, and God did not accept because God provided the shedding of blood. So, so what makes, got to come back to this, so what makes Abel's sacrifice acceptable to God? Three times in Hebrews chapter 4, chapter 11, verse 4, he says, by faith. It's by faith. We've got to unpack that a little bit. I'm, I'm just going to get one point today, looks like, but that's okay. We still have church every Sunday. You see, like his brother, both had instruction on what pleases God. And the Bible tells us in the New Testament that the only the way that we can please God is through what? Say it, church. By faith. So, so here's the bottom line. Abel had a faith response to the Word of God. He understood this is the principle that God has established from, from the very beginning. And thus, the only way of a better sacrifice, a sacrifice that's acceptable, a sacrifice that's pleasing unto God, he had to know that it has to be obedient to God. Romans, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, what's this? Consequently, faith comes by what? hearing the Word of God, and the Word of God is, is Jesus. So, so he understood that God had spoken this, his parents had spoken this over him, and he understood that faith comes by hearing the Word of God and actively being obedient according to the Word of God, and not what he interprets to be a sacrifice that might be acceptable to God, but only what God says about that. Let's tie this together here. Next sentence, Joe. Come on. The single most important work of an authentic Christian is having a faith response to the Word of God. You see, church, we must live our lives according to the Word of God. It changes us. It forms us. It, it molds us. It shapes us. And that's the faith that Abel had. Now, you can go out of this room and say, you know what, I'm going to do it my way. I'm just going to continue to do the best I can. You can, you can continue to do your way and, and without fully understanding that the only way that, that you will have God's approval in your life and God's acceptance in your life is that you become, the Bible says, a living sacrifice unto Him. That means you live a life of faith, that you trust Jesus Christ as in His shed blood as the redemption of your life and the forgiveness of your life. There is no other way other through Jesus Christ and His sacrifice. Do you understand that? There's no other way. The Bible says that many will stand before God and they'll say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do miracles and signs and wonders and all these wonderful works? Didn't we do all that? And he will look to those and say, I do not know who you are because it is only through the covering of the blood of Jesus Christ that we are accepted into his kingdom. And so we come back to this question. I'm going to close with this because, man, I've, I've still got ten more pages of notes. 
when I stand before God, and where you stand before God, and you will, and I will, how will I know God will accept me and approve of me? Because He's a holy God, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm sinful. How will you know that? How will I know that? Isn't that, isn't that a mandate of eternal question that we've got to ask and answer today, right? And here's the truth about it. It's not by your own good works. It's not by your own strength. It's by having a faith relationship with the Word of God. And here's what the Word of God says. That if anyone can confess with their mouth that He is Lord, salvation will come. You must confess Jesus as your Savior and as the only way, as the shed blood of Jesus Christ has clothed you in righteousness and finds favor. He is the only way in your life through eternal life. And when you stand before Him that day, the Bible says that Jesus will stand on your behalf because He represents you because of His blood and His sacrifice. The Bible says that who will open up the Word? Who will open up the eternalness of God? And all the angels said, there's no one that can do that. And finally, the Bible says in Revelation that the Lamb of God stood, the one who was sacrificed once and for all. We see from the very beginning the sacrificial lamb that God initiated from the very beginning and clothed Adam and Eve. When they couldn't do them themselves, God says, I'll, I'll clothe you. And at the very end, we see the Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb of God, the final sacrifice, the Lamb of God who fulfills all of law and all of righteousness for our sake. He stands and says, I am the Lamb of God who takes away all of sin. It's through Christ. If you don't know Christ, you've heard the gospel today. If you walk out those doors without Jesus Christ, it is your choice. And like Cain, like Cain, there will be a mark in your life that will be for eternity, and you'll be removed from His presence. Let's pray. Father, we love You. We adore You. Thank You that You did not leave that up to ourselves to determine how in the world can you accept us? You show us so clearly in your word how that happens and yet goes way beyond us and we try to muster up enough stuff in us and things in us to cover. But when it's all said and done, it's only through Jesus Christ and acceptance and by faith, trusting, living an active and obedient life unto you. I pray for anyone here today, Father, you know their hearts, I don't. Anyone who's apart from you this day, that today truly would be the day that they'd give their life over to you. They'll just stop themselves of destroying themselves with those things that look seemingly good and pleasing to their own way. But today would be their day that they yield their life over to you once and for all and give a living sacrifice because of the blood of Christ. There are many believers in this room today that have struggled with this idea of self-worth and their own righteousness and the possibility of what does their life look like at the end. Father, may there be a reflection what eternity is, but also how we're to live our life today. May we be people of faith as times are going to get harder and harder that we'll not draw back and withdraw ourselves, but we will be faithful to the very end and we'll be found faithful unto you. And though you may say, well done, good faithful servant, because we were obedient to the wellness of God in his word. Father, again, we thank you for this time, this time of communion. It's time of breaking the bread and the cup in remembrance of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. For that we are grateful. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray together. Amen. Amen. God bless you.